Hey guys, in this particular video I'll be formally proving the conservation of momentum. So to do that let's consider two arbitrarily sized objects. This will be object 1 of mass m1 and this will be object 2 of mass m2 and let's say they're on a collision course with each other. So m1 is traveling in roughly this direction before collision and m2 is traveling in roughly this direction before collision and let's say we wanted to find out what they look like sometime during the collision. So they look something like this, I'm guessing. That looks something like this. This will be mass M2. This will be mass M1, right? And let's consider the forces acting on them at some arbitrary time during collision. So not the instant they collide, not the instant they stop colliding, but at some time during collision, right? Let's consider what happens um, force-wise. So we'll have two forces in this free body diagram. One force will be acting on the second object due to the first object. That's this blue force, which I'll call force one, because it's due because it's it's from the first object. Right? We're also going to have an equal and opposite force here, and this will be force two. Right? Let's 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 just reiterate the importance of this. This is at some time t during collision, right? This isn't the instant it finishes colliding, this isn't the instant it starts colliding, this is some arbitrary time t. Another important thing to realize is that these forces might not be constant. In fact, it's totally reasonable to expect that they're not, right? Just imagine, the magnitudes of these forces will be changing dramatically depending on how compressed these two objects are against each other. They might even be changing in direction if the whole if they're just rotating around each other during collision. So it's, it's crucial to say that they're functions of time. Force 2 is a function of time, force 1 is a function of time, because they change during collision, right? Now let's consider what, now let's consider the free body diagram of each of these individual objects. So let's do the free body diagram, free body diagram of object 1. All right, so let's consider this. Let's, here's, our, here's our object one right here. There's only going to be one force acting on it. Remember, this is of mass M1. There's only one force acting on it, and that's due to the second object, and that's this green force, which I called F2, right? And remember, it's a function of time. Okay, well, Newton can help us out here. It, recall that from Newton's laws, he says that the sum of forces acting on an object is equal to the mass of that object times by the acceleration of that object. So in this case, force 2 is going to be equal to m1 times a1. We also know that acceleration can be rewritten as the change in rate of velocity with respect to time. So we've got one equation which is going to be really useful right here. Now let's consider a free body diagram of the second object. So let me write that down. This is going to be the free body diagram. Let me draw it in white. This is the free body diagram of our second object. So our second object, remember it has mass m2, and if you scroll up you can see that there's one force acting on it, and that's that blue force right here. So there's one force acting on it, and it's in roughly this direction, and it's force 1, and it's a function of time. So we can use the same thing, we can do the same thing we did before, and that is the sum of forces acting on an object is equal to the mass of that object times by the acceleration of that object, meaning that we can say that force 1 is equal to m2 times dv2 dt. So we've got two formulas right here. We've got two formulas, this one and this one, but we have no way to equate them yet. We've got no way to relate them to each other. They've all got different terms. Fortunately, this is where Newton's third law comes in handy. So we can recall Newton's third law. And that is that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. When put in physics terms, that just means that every force is coupled with an equal and opposite force. So we can actually say that force 1 is equal to in magnitude but opposite in direction to force 2. Right, this is another huge formula we're going to be using. And, and just in case you don't fully understand the intuition behind this, just imagine throwing a basketball against the wall. You're throwing the basketball against the wall during their collision. 
the wall is exerting a force back on the basketball, and the basketball is exerting a force on the wall. So we've got three formulas now, and we can equate them all. So let me zoom out so you can see. What I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute F1 into here, and I'm going to substitute F2 into here as well. And we're left with, if I scroll down, we're left with F1, which recall was just M2 dV2 dt, must be equal to minus F2. And if you recall, F2, let me scroll up so you can see, F2 was M1 dV1 dt. So that's M1 dV1 dt, right? Okay, well, this, this isn't too hard. What we can do now is we can say if it's true, if it's true that mass M1 and mass M2 remain constant, in other words, no chunks of mass are falling off them during collision, that means, what, that means we can suck these scalars into the differential sign. So let me show you what I mean by that. We can actually rewrite the left-hand side as saying ddt, ddt of m2 v2. Right? We could also rewrite the right-hand side as being minus ddt, ddt of m1 v1. Right? So that's pretty crucial. Now, now, we've got a, now we've got a slightly more simplified expression, but um, we, it's, it's, we're still not quite there. In order to do that, let me just bring this green expression over to the left-hand side, and we're left with ddt, ddt of m2 v2 plus ddt of m1 v1 must be equal to our zero vector. Notice we're dealing with vectors here. Um, and in case you're a little bit unfamiliar with what the zero vector is, that just means it's zero in the x, y, and z coordinates. Okay, so, so this becomes um, uh, an interesting expression because what we can do is we can realize that the differential operator has the distributive property. And that's really just fancy way of saying that we can just bring the differential operator outside both of these terms. And we can write this as m2 v2 plus m1 v1 is going to be equal to your zero vector. And if you don't believe me, you can do this in reverse too. Remember, if you differentiate a whole um, chunk of terms in the middle, that's the same as differentiating each of the individual terms. We can integrate both sides now. And what we're left with once we times both sides by dt, oops, once we times both sides by dt and integrate, we're left with the integral of d of d m2 v2 plus plus m1 v1 is going to be equal to the integral of our zero vector dt. Now integration of vectors is very similar to the integration of just plain scalars. What we're doing is I'm um, just integrating each of the individual components. Um, I'm going to assume we've got uh, some previous um, understanding of integration of vectors, but if you don't, I mean, it's, it's really not too dissimilar. Now, we're stuck at crossroads here. We can choose to evaluate the definite integral. That's by putting limits on these integral signs. Or we can evaluate the indefinite integral and just figure out what the boundary conditions are. So I'm going to go down the second route um, because I, I, I really want to do this step by step. So what I'm going to be doing is integrating this side, which we know, recall that if you integrate dx, that's the same thing as saying the integral of 1 dx. That's the exact same thing as what we're doing here. Notice that in this case, there's a coefficient of 1 right here. So we can just write this as we can just write this as we can just write this as m2 let me keep the colors going this will be m2 v2 <clears throat> plus m1 v1 right plus some constant is going to be equal to the integral of our zero vector which is just going to be a constant vector right so that's that this k is our integrational constant right here so this is actually a really amazing equation right here, mainly because it's just so generic. This shows that if you if you substitute the definition of momentum, which is momentum is defined to be equal to your mass times your velocity of your mass, that means that we can write this as your momentum of your second object at any time during collision 
plus your momentum of your first object at any time during collision is always going to be equal to the same constant vector. This is incredible, and it may not be striking you as incredible just yet, but hopefully you'll realize once you realize just how generic this expression really is. It shows that the total momentum and let me just say the total momentum at any time during collision is always going to be equal to a constant. So that means at the start of collision, the total momentum is going to be equal to a constant. Three seconds into the um, collision, the, the total momentum is going to be constant. Ten seconds into collision, the total momentum is going to be constant. And even at the very end of your collision, the total momentum is going to be equal to the same constant k. All right, so let me just write down two special cases of the formula I've written above. That is, the momentum of your second object just as they start colliding, plus the momentum of your first object just as they start colliding is going to be equal to that constant. Another special um, case of this equation I've written above is the momentum of your second object just as they finish colliding, which I'll denote as this F right here, plus the momentum of our first object as they finish colliding is also going to be equal to this constant vector that I've written right, right here. All right, well, we can use these two equations right now and use, um, and we can substitute the k um, in, into themselves. So what I can do is I can just substitute equation one into equation two, and we're left with the momentum of our second object when they start colliding plus the momentum of our first object when they start colliding is going to be equal to is going to be equal to the momentum of our second object when they finish colliding plus the momentum of our first object when it finishes colliding this is a formal proof of the conservation of momentum that's because if you look at it this right here is the total momentum before collision collision, and this is the total momentum after collision. I hope you can read my writing, but if you can't, that's all right. So this really proves that, con that, that, that momentum has been conserved. It shows that the momentum before they've collided is going to be equal to the total momentum after they've collided. So that is a formal proof of the conservation of momentum. Just before I finish this video, I want to talk briefly about the conservation of energy. Because you may have thought that another way you could have proven this formula is through the conservation of energy. You could have thought, okay, you could have applied the change in mechanical energy is equal to the work done by non-conservative forces and assumed that the work done by non-conservative forces is zero and shown that kinetic energy is conserved. You cannot do that in this particular case. And I really want to express, um, I guess, I, I really want to talk about why you can't. And that's because during their collision, some of the energy is being stored up in friction, is being used up in friction, being used up in heat, being used up in the deformation of the objects themselves as they're colliding with each other. So that means if we were to assume that this force is zero, that would be wrong, right? Don't forget that energy is being lost during the collision. So the conservation of kinetic energy doesn't exist in this particular case because there's, there's, it's, it's, there's, there are losses. So it would be a mistake of us to use the conservation of energy in this particular case, with the exception of, say, el um, elastic collisions. But that's a special case, which I'll get into another video. All right, guys, that's, that's one particular formula which is going to be really useful, and I'll show you a few particular um, examples of how to apply it. Thanks, guys.